we're to be people of action. Would it be maybe easier for us if we weren't vocal about our faith? Yeah, probably in some ways it would. If we just had our gathering time here on Sunday and it kind of stayed here among the family and didn't go out into the culture, I suspect the culture would be happy for us to not go out and, and rejoice. And Peter, though, makes a pretty convincing case here that if you are saved, you can't help it. If you are saved, you want others to know it. And if you're going to be holy because God is holy, you want it. You're excited about the opportunity to be more like him, conformed not to the world, but from the world. Good morning, welcome to Lee Park Church. It's time to worship together. Whether you're in front of the screen or you're starting to meet each other in the house and uh, fellowship together, in just a moment, live worship will start. So get ready. I encourage you to pray today. Pray that we will have authentic worship. Pray that the word of God will be preached. Pray for Pastor Chris as he brings it today. And then pray for the response of the people. So let's see what happens as we worship together at Lee Park. Park Church. Happy to see you this morning. Palm Sunday. Stand with us as we begin our worship service together. Let's all praise His holy name. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Presence, all our fears are washed away. They're 
sing that because when because when we see you we find strength to face the day in your presence come on in your presence all our fears are washed away they're washed away
Please be seated. Welcome to Lee Park today. I'm Chris Justice, the pastor here, and so glad that you're here today. I didn't catch this in the first service in here, but the songwriters of that song did an excellent job. That phrase, Hosanna, that word Hosanna, uh, initially meant God save us, but then later it became a, a song, a word of praise to God. And you notice the songwriter there put both of those aspects in that, so that was good. We're going to talk a little bit about that later in the sermon. So I did not catch that, but good. whoever wrote that song, good for them. That was very <laughs> educated writing of that. Uh, if you are a guest with us today, I am so glad that you are here. We are practicing uh, for Easter, getting ready for Easter. We've got these guest passes that we give out, and these guest passes, um, when you get them, if you're a guest, you go back to the information or the uh, starting point desk, which is right out those double doors all the way out to the parking lot. You'll see a starting point desk off to your right. And when you turn that in, if you're a first-time guest or second-time guest, you'll get a gift. First time, you get a mug, and you get um, a uh, coupon for free coffee from our uh, bookstore. Second time, if you're a second-time guest, you get Chick-fil-A gift card for free Chick-fil-A, which is awesome. And so finding you is, that's the thing we've been practicing because we're getting ready for Easter. We're going to really do this well. So if you're a guest here today... Uh, I'm so glad because you're going to help us. You're going to make sure that we get this right. If you do not get a guest pass and you're a guest, when, when, when we're done, sorry, sometimes when you use the brush your wife uses, you end up, <laughs> I feel like I've got, I'm being attacked. By, I, did I get it? Did I? Okay. I tried to nonchalantly go like this while I was talking. It just didn't work. Is it gone? Okay. How many people? Oh, oh, I think there was another one. Okay. Sorry. You'll see my wife here in just a second. She has beautiful hair. I just don't want it on my head. Um, where was I? Oh, when you're a guest, if you don't get a guest pass, then when I get, when, when I get ready to preach, just if you would, just stand up, raise your hand, make a public complaint, and we will know. Still go, just go back to the, the desk anyway, and then we'll know that we still got to get a little bit better at this, okay? So now if you're a guest, you're like, I don't, how are they even going to find me? How are they going to know where I am? Watch this. Guest, you stay seated and watch what happens. You may be seated. So glad to have you with us today. You picked a great Sunday. Man, there's a lot of people here. Man, thank you for coming to church on Palm Sunday. We're so glad to have you with us. Baptisms are coming up. I'm so excited about baptisms. Some great folks back there. There's a little girl who's grown up in this church, and her family, is, they celebrated a wedding yesterday, and they served this church. Man, there's just such good things happening. The Lord is very faithful and very good. We give him all praise. Well, thank you for the ways that you give. You text to give. You give online. You give at the doors. And we're able to do so, so, so much. This week we got to feed the hospital in uh, Indian Trail. We're nice to, we're nice to out-of-towners in Indian Trail. We're in Monroe, folks. We like Indian Trailers, too. Anyway, we got to, to feed them and go give a lot of you work there. And so it was rich, such a neat, neat, neat experience, and we love doing it. And the kitchen crew, we just, I'm so thankful for them. They're such a blessing. And then we also got to do the House of Pearls a fundraiser for them. So God is faithful. God is good. And all of the countless other ways that, that the Lord used what you are faithfully giving back unto him. And so we just give him praise for that. And then I want to make sure you remember next week is our family fun day. Next Saturday at from 2 to 4, we're having an egg hunt from 2 to 2.30. In those eggs will be chocolate, okay? And it'll be sugar. We don't put, uh, no, yeah. There will be no granola and actual fruit, okay? That's for you to buy for your children. We 
want them to come to love church. So it'll be sugar, okay? That's the only reason we do it. We're not trying to buck your parenting. We just want them to love church and sugar. I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. But next week, 2 to 2.30 is the Easter egg hunt, and it's going to be a fun, fun, fun time. I hope you do that. Pastor Chris has agreed to dress like butter, too. I had to update on that. <laughs> I think that's true. Yep. We went to Ty's. Ty hosted a big event at Liberty last night. It didn't start till 11.30, so we had to drive back, and we didn't get back till 5. And somebody who's going to talk him into wearing a butter costume by holding this over her head, I drove, I drove most of the way, didn't I, baby? You did. Do you think that's true? You did. No, you really, you were a champ last night. It was five, we didn't get back till 540, and you drove the last two and a half so hours. So Butter Twins, it will be <laughs> me and Pastor Chris. I love him so much. So fun. It'd be so fun. <laughs> he wears it with such joy. It's so fun. <laughs> he absolutely draws the line at the hat, though. He will not wear the hat. <laughs> we have a blood drive today. Today, out in the, out in the, out, out, out there. And you get it out there somewhere in that area, general vicinity. You can get a QR code, and you get a $20 gift card. If you haven't signed up, but you could too, do it now. If not, you'll be ready for the next one. But yeah, you do have to sign up so you're not an axe murderer. Axe murderers have different blood, I hear. And so you have to sign up online. That wasn't funny. I'm not sorry to all axe murderers. I'm very sorry to you for having me say ex murderer four times in announcements. Anyway, that's that's your QR code. All right, and then also um, just want to thank you for uh, coming to church today. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday. Let me just tell you the times. We had to get rid of one service. Can we get a little ambitious? Pastor Chris and I are ready to be here. We, we're, we're already, we're going to go right after this service. We go into Easter game time, planning for next week. So we get pretty excited about stuff. I'm excited about breakfast, bread pudding. I'm going to make you bread pudding. It'll be so good with caramel sauce on top. Doesn't that sound yummy? And some egg casserole and some sausage and some grits. And by the way, I, mean, I don't mean to brag. But for a girl from Ohio, I can make grits. And so that's, that's we, maybe we should put it on the logo of the church. That's a smattering of applause for the grits. Maybe I should try harder. It's okay. It's okay. I got to win you over. I understand. But that's next Sunday. So at 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock is our first service out on the Sunrise Service over at the Mission. The new property over there, we just refinished the house. There's a pickball court. There's a fire pit. It's right off to this side on the other side of the FLC. We're also, we're going to need, we're going to have that service there, but then we're going to quickly have to start using that for parking. And so there are people who make uh, decisions here, and we kind of think, oh, that's so great, that's so great. But we don't think about the parking thing. Pastor Kit thinks about the parking thing. And so he kindly reminded us that we probably needed a little spot to have parking and people not crossing an actual road to go <laughs> over while we have traffic coming in. And so we won't have that 10 o'clock, but we'll have a 9 o'clock in here and then a 11 o'clock in here. And then, so, of course, all those that come get up for sunrise service will have a breakfast for you in the FLC. It'll be a great, great day. Easter is always a great day. It's also a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time to invite your lost friends, your neighbors, your saved friends who are not attending church. Please, please, please invite your friends. It's never a better time. It never a better time to ask someone to go to church with you. Now, the prayer time today is just, honestly, just heartbreaking. And this is, uh, if you are praying people, which I hope all of you are, all of us that confess Jesus as Lord in our lives and believe in the power of prayer, I hope that you're praying for them. But, we, you know, we count it as an honor, but also this is just so sad this week. And so as you listen to them, maybe write down their names. And, and, and look for a way to, to love on the families. Ask the ladies at the front desk if you can help. But Sunny Williams, we've been telling you about, she's an 11-year-old girl who has a brain tumor. And we need you to pray for Sunny and her family, all of her family, all of her friends. She is precious in every way. But they have let, let the family know that treatment is no, no longer an option and that they need to shower her with love. And so we want to pray for Sunny this morning. Sunny, we love you. Your church loves you. And then I want to make sure I say this right, David and Trudy Millsap, that your granddaughter's name is Aria. Aria, seven-year-old granddaughter. Um, was diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia. At, listen to me now. At age two, she is given chemo daily through her G-tube. Please pray. At her next oncology appointment, her blood levels will be low so that she can qualify for a trial that would take her off of her medication, mm -hmm. ultimately to be cancer-free. So be praying for them. 
and look for ways to love on them. And then Knox Tice, a five-year son of Michael and Lauren Tice. Michael has grown up in this church. His, his mom and dad have been faithful members for many, 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 many years. And then their, their son, their five-year-old son, is taking chemo treatments for lymphoma. So please pray for his feeling. And then Pastor Chris, you can tell him about Miss Becky, too. Yeah. Um, Miss Becky Norwood? Yeah. Yeah, she was here in the 9 o'clock service. She's got things going on. I don't, I don't think we know enough to tell you all about it, but what they go through to get here on a Sunday, how Billy drops her off so she doesn't have to walk far because she can't, and then, and then he goes and parks her and he's not well either, and they come. So I, we just want you to know, for some of you, it's a real struggle to gather together, and the Bible says this is important. There's value in the gathering. Not, we're not to forsake this, and some of you go through a lot of, it's hard for you to get here, and so I thank you for what you do because this is an important time. And we're going to stand together and pray for our brothers and sisters. And by the way, little Knox watches us online, who's going through his uh, cancer treatments. And, and uh, so want to say, hey, buddy, thanks for continuing to watch. Uh, let's pray, okay? God, we sometimes, because your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts, we, we struggle sometimes with how to pray because this is the existence we know and you promise us that there is a place beyond this place in fact you say if we believe in God we should also believe in you and in your father's house there are many dwelling places and if it weren't so you would have told us and that you're going to prepare a place for us so that where you are we will be also and we believe that to be true we also believe it to be true by faith when you say that you are ever present in a time of need and we believe that and and God still we sometimes don't know how to pray when we hear some of the things that we've heard today. But you would expect us to pray for healing because you can heal. You would expect us to pray for a remarkable comfort and endurance for these families who are dealing with this because really only you can provide it in the ways it needs to be provided. And so, God, we ask for these things and, and then we trust you. We trust you, and we trust your will. We trust your way. We trust your sovereignty. And, and we will, in any situation, worship you and give you praise and honor and glory. While we know this place and we seem to grab on to this place, God, help us to understand better and look forward to the place where you promise where there's no more sadness, no more tears, no more fear, no more pain. Those things have passed away. So as we balance those aspects of prayer, we offer them to the one who knows the proper balance. God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh. 
Praise be to God. Happy Palm Sunday, Lee Park. What a what I Parker. What a wonderful thing to do, singing holy, holy God Almighty on this Palm Sunday. And an even better thing to do is to have some baptisms. Amen? Amen. All right, let's get after it. My name is Abigail Madrosa, and I'm getting baptized today because I love the Lord, and I want people to know that. So this is Abby. She's a sixth grader in our youth group. Is her family down here? Is your in the front row? There we go. That was her one request. So I asked her, is there anything specific you want me to say? Like anything for your family? And she said, for my family, can you just say that Abby's the best? <laughs> Abby is the best. <laughs> Abby, do you love Jesus? Yes. Will you follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Based on your profession of faith, and your willingness to follow and believe his baptism, I baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ, raised with Christ. <laughs> Newbauer, and I'm getting baptized today. Um, I'm doing it to show the Lord how much I love him, but also to uh, kind of close the chapter and close the coffin on um, the previous lifestyle that I was living and let this new lifestyle and my road um, and my faith just continue to grow. And um, yeah. In Matthew chapter 28, after the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he gives the call to the Great Commission to his disciples. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them, I'll be with you to the end of age. That invitation was not just for those early disciples, but for all believers. This is why we preach. This is why we teach. This is why we worship. This is why we praise, and this is why we pray. That one might come to salvation, but today we got four. That's a reason to celebrate. Thank you, Father. So my brother, have you today or at some point in your life come to your understanding of a need of a Savior? Yes, I have. Are you sure? I'm positive. Is that Savior, in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ? It is. Tell him it's Jesus. It's Jesus. There you go. There you go. With that profession of faith, it is my honor and my privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Betsy Barnett and I'm getting baptized today because I feel like the Lord has called me to do this and I want to be obedient to him. We should probably stand for these kind of things, right? We should probably stand and celebrate when people make a public profession of faith. It says that there is celebration in heaven when one sinner repents. I don't know. Yeah, there you go. There you, that's what we should do. To my sister. In the presence of many witnesses, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you today, or at some point in your life, come to your understanding of a need of a Savior? I have. Are you sure? Absolutely. Is it Jesus Christ? It is. Tell them who it is. It's Jesus Christ. With that profession of faith, it is my honor and my privilege to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My name is Jeremy Nash. I was saved at the age of 15 and continued to follow Christ. But now as a husband and father of three, I realize the importance of being the spiritual leader in my household. So today I want to publicly profess my love for my Lord and Savior. All right, so Jeremy's story is that uh, he made a commitment to Christ at 15 years old at Camp Castle, a church summer youth camp. Yeah. And uh, always had a belief in Jesus, but by his own words, just kind of went through the motions in his faith. Until recently, over the past year, God has really been working in his life, fully surrendered his life to Christ. He's very connected here at Lee Park through the men's ministry, through a Wednesday night Bible study, and now through a community group. And man, we are so proud of the work that God is doing in your life. Thank you. Do you love Jesus Christ? I do. And is it your desire to keep following him for the rest of your life? It is. And it's my honor and privilege to baptize you. You've been buried with Christ in his death, raised to walk in new life in heaven. I'm going to pray and then we'll continue in worship. 
God, we just humbly and gratefully say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you are doing here at Lee Park. Lord, this is your church. I thank you that we see evidence through baptism of how you alone are changing hearts and lives. Lord, we are so grateful for these four that have publicly proclaimed and professed their faith today. God, I pray that you'd use their lives in a, such a powerful way. I pray you'd use us at Lee Park, Lord, in any way possible as they grow to become more like you. Again, God, we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
you would think after 18 years of preaching somewhere along the line I would have preached Matthew 21 1 through 11 on Palm Sunday and here we are on Palm Sunday and in preparing for the message I went back to look at some files and thought I wonder what I would have said the last time I preached through Matthew chapter 21 verses 1 through 11 on Palm Sunday over 18 years you would think there are four Gospels. You would think I would have bumped into this somewhere along the line in 18 years of preaching. However, I couldn't find a single sermon preached from Matthew 21, 1 through 11 on Palm Sunday. What kind of pastor have you had for the past 18 years? Now, the good news is what you're going to get today. Now, maybe there's a file out there and I just couldn't find it. Maybe you've marked in your Bible. I did preach through this at some time, but at least this is for sure. You're not going to get some rehashed, reworked Palm Sunday sermon. This is hot off the presses, and I'm excited about uh, preaching it. So if you would, turn to Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. We'll get back to our series through John's gospel after Easter Sunday, but we're going to spend the next couple weeks here in the book of Matthew. While you're turning there, uh, we did this last week and got really good response, so much so that I'm going to do one more week of this. If you think maybe that God has put a call on your life to preach and you're not sure what to do with it, and you think, well, maybe, should I go to school? Should I, how do I? Well, I'm a part of a group now that is trying to develop to find guys who feel a call on their life to preach and then help them take some of those next steps. There are 11% of our Southern Baptist churches do not have pastors. If you've got 4,300 Southern Baptist churches, that's a lot of pulpits today, right now on Palm Sunday, without a pastor. And so we want to try to help. We want to help guys that, you know, maybe there's a call in my life to, to do something. And uh, so there's a QR code. And if you hit that, you can register. This is the North Carolina Baptist Send Project. And if you are interested in, in a residency, helping a church and having other pastors pour into you, in, and maybe seeing that God has maybe led you to this, um, then we would love to have you sign up, hit that code, and then register. And then we'll be meeting, I think, in sometime in April and look forward to, uh, uh, to maybe seeing if we can uh, help you along that process if you think God's leading you there. Matthew 21 starts the last week of the life of Jesus. The ministry, the miracles the Galilean ministry, the time when he takes his followers away and does specific training and teaching with them, that has now come to an end. Jesus has been to the Passover before during his ministry, but now he ends knowing this Passover will end with his crucifixion. He enters Jerusalem knowing he will ultimately be guilty of all sin, even though he hasn't committed one. All sin that has ever been committed, all sin that will be committed, all heaped on him at the cross. And he knows at this Passover, it will end with him then enduring an eternal measure of the wrath of God poured out on him on the cross. And he knows as he enters Jerusalem for this Passover, it will end with extreme suffering, a death that was considered the most shameful version and painful way to die. And he knows that he will indeed die. So in this Palm Sunday that he starts this, what we call the Passion Week, I want you to see today that the king enters on Palm Sunday and the cross awaits. Would you stand with me? Let's honor the reading of God's Word. 
I apologize for all the up and down confusion today. I hope that didn't confuse you, but we do want to stand for the reading of God's Word. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11, when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought them the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them. Jesus sat on the coats. He sat on the colt and on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road and others were cutting branches from trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's pray. God, thank you for this truth. Thank you for the time we've had together. Thank you for the ways that we have been able to worship you today. Through prayer, through music, through baptisms. And now by your grace, we have the opportunity to open your word and hear you speak. We're thankful for that. We pray to you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, the entry to Jerusalem, as you know, is called the triumphal entry. And it is, hits at a time at the height of the popularity of Jesus. By now, the ministry has reached its conclusion and the miracles of Jesus have brought a huge following. He's fed thousands. He's healing people. His, his ministry in the signs and wonders is moving the culture. Remember, they're, they're socioeconomically very poor with no real chance of advancement. And so here's somebody who comes, gives them hope and, and gives them help in many cases. So there's a big following around that because they... They want hope. In fact, while Jesus is leaving Jericho, which is where he is, thus, by the way, the reason for Palm Sunday, they wouldn't have had palm branches in Jerusalem, but in Jericho, you would have had. Jesus is coming from Jericho as there's this mass movement of God's people back to Jerusalem to be at the temple. And so from Jericho, they're coming carrying their palm branches and they're moving to the area and there's conversation, lots of conversation going on because of the excitement that Jesus is coming with them. So much conversation that there are two blind men, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 20, you see this, there are two blind men that are sitting by the road. They hear the conversation. Then as Jesus comes by, they hear people speaking to Jesus and, and probably Jesus speaking back to them so much so that they then shout out. They shout out to Jesus. They, they say, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And Jesus asks them, what do you want? And they said, we want to see. We know who you are and we want to see. And then the Bible says in Matthew chapter 20, verse 34, moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. You can imagine they were pretty excited followers, that the excitement is continuing to build and this mass crush of people coming out of Jericho and moving towards Jerusalem, Jesus is there and is extremely popular. The disconnect comes in the mission. The, the miracles, people loved the miracles, they wanted to be a part of the miracles, and, and remember, Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead, who'd been dead four days. So there's lots of excitement about the the miracles of Jesus, but the, the mission of Jesus is still confusing for people. After feeding thousands of people, Jesus brought people in and said, look, I'm the bread of life. He claims equality with God, and many people just left. We don't want to hear that. You're Joseph's son. We don't want to hear that. Even his own disciples are struggling with the idea that he would go to Jerusalem and be crucified. 
So we've, we've just read in Matthew 21, 1 through 11, he goes in this triumphal entry. But again, back to Matthew chapter 20, Jesus says this to his followers in verses 18 and 19. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes. They will condemn him to death, hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him, and on the third day, he'll be raised up. Now you would think, the next conversation would be about that statement. You've had a hard time understanding it. You don't want to talk about it. I want to make sure you know what's going to happen. When I go in, the religious ruling class is going to put me into a fake trial for the purpose of killing me. But I want you to know that in three days, I'll rise from the dead. You would think it would be, whoa, let's talk about that. But the next conversation, as you keep reading in the text, is the mother of James and John says, by the way, Jesus, when you set up your earthly kingdom, can my boys be on your right hand and left hand so they can have power? That's the first thing that would come to your mind? They still don't want to talk about the idea that he's going to die. They think maybe it's metaphorical, maybe it's, but, but certainly that's not going to happen. So the, the miracles have the excitement. The mission, we'll still see here in the text, brings about some confusion. But with all the excitement and the amazing week about to unfold, certainly what Jesus wants at the end of this week is not an earthly throne. He knows he is headed to the cross. And with that in mind, let's look at three aspects of this triumphal entry to give us some perspective on the awesome and terrible things that are going to happen in Jerusalem. The first thing I want you to see is the directed entry. So Jesus is just outside Jerusalem in some nondescript village. We think it's near Bethany. Bethany would be where Lazarus was. So again, there's lots of excitement about this area. Huge number of Jews coming in. I'm going to tell you a second about the numbers. I wish I could be more precise. But Jerusalem, when it wasn't Passover or time of some other feast, some expectations and, and, and some estimates are there would have been about thirty to 40,000 people in Jerusalem sort of Jerusalem proper when they weren't in a time of feast. Now, others estimate higher than that. But for the sake of what we're going to do, let's say thirty to 40,000. It gives us a good visual because that's the size of Monroe. Monroe is the last estimate in 2021, I think 33,000 people. We're probably up closer to 40,000 now. So in a town about the size of Monroe, let's say the 900,000, thousand people that the census says there are in Charlotte. They fan out and they start walking to Monroe, 900,000. And from the south, let's say South Carolina sends uh, 600,000 up. And again, fanning out. So you've got a million and a half descending on Monroe. The temple area, the temple complex, even the, the place where the trading was going on, and also where the high priest would gather, that whole area would be about the size of downtown Monroe if you start at Main Street at the courthouse and you go down to First Baptist in Monroe. That length and about a couple, two, three blocks wide, that would have been the size of the temple complex. You got a million and a half people, give or take, coming into Monroe to try to gather in that area. Now, which also gives us later when Jesus clears the temple, hundreds and thousands of people are cleared out of the temple area based on the sheer power of the will of Christ because he is so disgusted with what they are doing with his father's house. So in, in this scene, if you can picture that in this scene, here come all these people and there's this Jericho contingent with their palm branches waving. It, it seems as if into this moment, the religious ruling class is not going to be happy, and they're not. But let's back up to the donkeys real quick. Jesus says, go get the donkey, get the colt, and if they ask what's going on, say the Lord has need of them, and they'll just give them to you. Well, some people would look at that and say, well, he's, he's exerting his divine power to control the minds of other people, even when he's not there, right? He, had the, he healed the son of the uh, royal official who was two days walk away. He just said, your son's healed, and he was healed. So he would have the power to do that, and some people say that's what happened. Others would say, and I like this, I think I like this better. 
that during the time he ministered around there, which was extensive, and during the times he was there for Passover, which was often, and if it would have been near where Lazarus was, and obviously he was friends with Lazarus, it seems to make sense he would have made relationships with other people. He was a relational Messiah. And it seems to me that it makes sense that the people who would say that he would have met this family, he would have met this couple, and would have said to the man who he was, the man would have believed who he was, and Jesus said, at some point, at some point, I'm going to send some people to take your donkey and the colt that she will have. And when they say the Lord has need, I want you to, to give them because I've, I, I'm going to be in need of them. I, I like that better because I think it shows the relational ability that Christ has with other people. But it also shows his absolute control in this moment. And here's why that matters. Having just raised Lazarus from the dead, the religious ruling class, remember they said after that, they didn't say, oh my goodness, he just brought a guy back to life who'd been dead for four days. They didn't say that. They said, we're going to kill him. Jesus now enters into Jerusalem. He's got a contingent. They're excited. He's riding in on a colt. We'll tell you why that matters in just a second. There's lots of stir. They know about the miracles. He's been all over the region doing miraculous things. The, Jerusalem is a buzz with Jesus is coming. The religious rulers hate it. The next day, he will clear the temple based on his sheer power of will. The religious rulers will hate it. They think they're in control because they're planning his death, but they don't don't want to kill him during the Passover week because you've got all these Jews there who right now love Jesus. So they're going to want to wait and do it later. They think they're in control of the time. Jesus shows he's in control of the time. His entrance nudges them. His clearing of the temple uh, irritates them. His teaching against them infuriates them. And in just the matter of a day and a half, they say, we're going to kill him this week. By Jesus sovereignly controlling the details of that on the day they would have the ceremonial sacrificing of the sacrificial lamb to remind them of the Passover when they were brought out of Egypt because the wrath of God passed over his people. The blood of the lamb made that happen. On that day, when they thought they could celebrate something that had happened long before, Jesus had it worked out that he would be killed on that day. The ultimate sacrificial lamb. The, perf the truly perfect sacrificial lamb and the blood that would offer peace beyond God's people to you and me. How does that apply to us now? Well, look, these are uncertain times. Our, our country seems at a crossroads, I guess. There's plenty of anger going around, plenty of doomsday scenarios. We're in an election year, so... Uh, this will be fun. There are like, I mean, there's a, there's a Republican, there's a Democrat, there's a Libertarian, there's a Green Party, and there's another dude. I don't even know what he's, I don't know, the Blue Party, I don't, Orange Party, whatever it is. He's in some, there could be five people running for president. And, and they, the, the primary focus is if you don't give us power, then anything that you decide that's not us, oh, it's just going to destroy everything. Well, look, it's bad. It's going to get worse because I've read Revelation. It's going to get a lot worse. But I think sometimes we feel as if we are sort of losing control. And as Christians, let's talk really about where, from where we are because I'm a Christian first. Before I'm anything else, I'm a Christian. And, and as a Christian, I think we recognize that there's a, there's a louder call for us to be quiet. There's a louder call for us to be religious in the church but not outside of the church. There's, there's a louder call on us not to express our religious leading in any other area of the world. Well, that, that's a historical thing. As, as man gets more powerful and more in love with man and more humanistic in their thinking and in their worldview, they want to go after Christians. And that's what we're seeing now, more humanism and more humanistic worldview. And now they want the Christians to shut up. Lots of religions out there, but we're the ones that seem to get them because we're evangelistic. We say Jesus can change you. And they think, no, we have the power. I say all of that to say this. As out of control as it might seem, my dear brothers and sisters, even 2,000 years later, please know this to be true. He is in control. He's in control. So for all that, yeah, I'm worried, I don't know if this can happen. There's persecution coming. There is persecution coming. The Bible says so. They're going to persecute us. The Bible says so. But even in that, he is in ultimate 
control. And in Revelation 21, 5, by the way, when he comes back the second time, he says, the one who sits on the throne says, behold, I am making all things new. Praise be to God. Second thing we see is a different entry. Verses 4 through 7, this is different. Why would you write in on a colt? I mean, maybe on the donkey, but why the colt? And you'd want to bring the mother donkey along because it maybe would help the colt settle. And certainly, the, even though the colt hadn't been written on before, it's going to be the perfect rider, and this will all be great. But this seems like a different entry. It is a different entry. But it is a prophetic entry from Zechariah 9.9. 9. Both John and Matthew mention that. Now, I want, to, I want you to turn to Zechariah chapter 9. Verse 9, I am going to put it on the screen, but I just want you to turn there. But I'm going to make it so easy, because you might be thinking, poof, Zechariah. You're in Matthew, go back to Malachi, go back to Zechariah. You're right there. You're right there. Go to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And while you're going there, let me give you the outline of Zechariah. It's a remarkable book. In Zechariah, the prophet calls for repentance. The people have been punished for their corruption. Now they're going to be cleansed. Through redemption, isn't that interesting? By asking to be forgiven. It's the model of Christianity. Then there are eight revelations in Zechariah. God will bless his people, empower his people, give victory to his people, punish the enemies of his people, and provide an example of the Messiah that is to come. Then there is the Messiah's merciful rewards. The Jews will be restored and returned to Israel. The Messiah will indeed come. He will be rejected. He will be crucified, but he still offers mercy anyway through faith. So that's what Zechariah says. It's a remarkable book. The, the, the prophecy of Zechariah that points ahead to Christ is, is unbelievable. It's scattered throughout. It's kind of hard to pick up, but this is what it's basically saying. Repent because you need to be rescued. The rescuer is coming to benefit his people. His people will reject him and kill him, and yet he'll offer them mercy anyway. Grace is when you get something you don't deserve. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. What do you deserve for rejecting Christ? Well, he gave mercy. So here's the different, here's why Zechariah chapter 9, uh, verse 9 is so important. In 1 through 8, the prophet Zechariah tells about this what all prophets do. Here's the issue now. Here's what's going to be in the future. That's the prophecy. Zechariah says, here's the issue now. Here's what's coming in the future. Then here's what's coming in the future beyond that. And then here's what's coming in the future beyond that. It's a remarkable book. So here's what he says. He says, you got to repent. And then he says in verses 1 through 8 of chapter 9, there is a, a war king coming. He's a war king. And he is, gonna, he is just going to destroy everything around Jerusalem. Okay, 200 years later, that happened, Alexander the Great. Maybe you're familiar with Alexander the Great, the Greek uh, war king who led the Grecian overthrow and pushing out and destruction of the Persians. When doing that, Alexander the Great had every reason to march into Jerusalem because the Jews, the, the Jews sided with the Persians. However, Alexander the Great, the war king, shows up on the doorstep of Jerusalem. He's destroyed everything around him. And the war king stops the army, gets off his war horse, walks in, meets the priests, God moves his heart as God is able to do. He honors God and walks out and does not attack Jerusalem. Now, that's the king people wanted. He's a war king. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, your king's different than that. So 200 years after Zechariah, Alexander the Great comes. 300 years after uh, Alexander the Great comes, Zechariah says, this is what's going to happen next. Now, verse 9, this is why it matters. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Not the war king. Your king is coming to you. He's different. He's not the war king. He's not a foreign king. He's from you. He's a very different king. They want war with the Romans. But when Jesus rode in on the colt, he's reminding them of what Zechariah said. Zechariah said, this is a very different king. He's just, he's endowed with salvation. 
He's humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That represents peace. The Jews want war. God's disciples would kind of like to see war. Jesus comes in as a peace offering from God to man. We declared war with our sin. We declared war on God by rejecting him and sinning against him. We deserve a war king to come and make it right, but he sent a peace offering that would end with that peace offering giving his life for ours. This is a different king. And Zechariah pleads with the people, don't miss this king. He's coming, not in your lifetime, not in generations' lifetime to come. The war king you love, but this is your king. This is your king. Don't miss him. He offers peace. This is your king. He's just. This is your king. He offers salvation. Please don't miss this king. And in Zechariah's prophecy, he says, most of you will. And still, this king offers you mercy. Which then leads perfectly into the last thing that we see, and then we'll be finished. The dithering entry. Okay, and I had to use dithering because it started with D, and I'm a preacher that likes alliteration. I also am a preacher that likes three points. So if you are someone who says, you know, I think I do want to be a preacher. Well, here's lesson number one. Three points is the only way to preach a godly sermon. And alliteration means you're not lazy. And you actually found a word that started with D that fit what you wanted to say. Or what the text says. Dithering means fickle. Means wavering. Dithering means not firm, not resolute. And this is what we see from the people. In, in verse 8, they're spreading their coats out on the road. The ones from Jericho are waving their palm branches. They're shouting Hosanna. We just talked about that. The original meaning meant save us, but it also just meant celebration. They're just celebrating. Some are saying save us. Some are saying we're just glad you're here, son of David. They seem to understand the ministry of John the Baptist. However, when they're asked, when they get into the city, who is this? They're not really exactly sure. Rather than say Messiah, they say prophet. They're just not clear. They're unwavering on this. One group, Luke says, one group is shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They got it right. And then Luke says in chapter 19, verses 39 to 40, some of the Pharisees in the crowd heard that. And they shouted out at Jesus, rebuke your disciples. Look what Jesus said. I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. The king is here. And if the people don't recognize me, creation will recognize me. And I know that because I created everything. That's what the Bible says. There's a lot of commotion going on is what I'm getting at. There's good and bad commotion. They're not really sure who he is. They're not really sure he, what he wants to do. Some are sure, others aren't, and the celebration then re reflects it. Craig Bloomberg notes this, the whole picture conveys celebration and honor that's reminiscent of the victory praise with which triumphant kings and generals in the Old Testament and intertestamental times were welcomed. But the strewing of garments and branches further demonstrates the crowds have the wrong messianic concept. There will be no victory party when they arrive in Jerusalem. The religious ruling class is not saying, yes, we know Zechariah, even though they did. The scribes are not saying he's doing exactly what Zechariah said would happen, even though they knew that to be true. They're not welcoming him. They're not celebrating. They're plotting his murder. Jesus knows this. That's why when he approached Jerusalem in Luke 19, 41 and 44, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept. If you had known this day, even to you, if you would have known the things which make for peace, you don't, you don't want to see them. They've been hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you, surround you and hem you in on every side. They will level you to the ground and your children within you. They will not leave in you one stone upon another. You didn't recognize. This is your time of visitation and you missed it. 
the prophecy of Zachary of Zechariah is right. He came offering peace, and the cheers that let him in turn into jeers in just a matter of days. The celebration that let him in, the, the seeming coronation that they're hoping. In a matter of days, these same people are agreeing with the idea of crucifixion. He offered peace from God. And as Zechariah said, they rejected the peace offering from God. But, as Zechariah also says, he still offers mercy. This is your king. I have messed up and I have messed up and I messed up. I can't imagine he would listen to me one more time if I come and pray to him. This is your king. He offers mercy. Oh, but you don't know, you don't know what I've done. He knows what you've done. And still, he offers mercy. I can't possibly be forgiven of this sin if your sin is greater than his sacrifice, then we've all got trouble. Your sin, as grievous as it might be, is not greater than his perfect body crucified on a cross and his blood to cleanse you of any and all sin. Your sin's not that great that can overcome the sacrifice of Christ. And this king offers you mercy. Will you, by faith, trust Christ? If you're here today and you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's offering you mercy. He offered his son as peace. And that Bible says, now by his grace, you by faith can come to him. You believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth. Jesus is Lord. God has raised him from the dead. The Bible says you can be saved. Stand with me. Let's close in a word of prayer. And if you are a believer... And as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you might stand here today and admit, you know what, I, he's been merciful to me because I have not developed in my faith like I should have. I've not been the kind of person that I should have. I'm still, I've still got some sin I like to carry around with me. I, I need to reject that because he is worth that. And the Holy Spirit is prompting me to do that. So if that's the case, here's what's going to happen now. I'm going to pray and give you the opportunity. Some of you might want to pray where you are. That's great. Some of you might want to come forward and kneel at the altar. That's great. And if you do, let's say the burden on you is so great, you want to bring it to the altar. Here's what will happen at Lee Park. Someone will come, a pastor, a deacon, will come put a hand on your shoulder. Someone in the church who, who is we're skilled at praying will come and put a hand on your shoulder. If you want to pray with them, just take their hand. They will kneel with you and they will pray with you. But if not, if you don't want to pray with them, just know that when they put their hand on their shoulder, just let you know you're not alone, and we love you. During this time of invitation, too, the song we're about to sing is uh, from Lee Park Worship. It's the, it'll be released to radio stations and the public on a Friday. Uh, the song is written by Pastor Shane Dunlap. We've sung it here once before. He wrote it during the week. They sang it on that same Sunday, and now it's ended up being the song, Why Wouldn't I Run? I think the words will speak to you because of the offer that Christ is giving you. Pastor, thank you for letting God use you to write these kind of words. Brooke and Carly, thank you guys for just having those amazing voices that you're willing to use. And Jason and Van, thank you guys for being so great. Well, so those of you who are left. God, we have an opportunity now to respond. And for some of us, it'll be praying where we are. For others, it'll be coming forward to pray. We, we were inspired by the baptisms today. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's people standing and professing faith in Christ publicly. Beautiful. And so now, God, this is the time where it becomes personal. Where are we in our relationship with you? As you deal with us, Holy Spirit, cause us to move. Either to come forward and pray, pray where we are, but to be serious about 
making the changes in our life that might for some of us be for salvation and for others for sanctification. That we would be more passionate about living the Christian life. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name.
Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was beautiful. And if you want to get a copy of that song for yourself to listen to, we're going to put a QR code up on the screen here in a few minutes. You can scan the code and you can put yourself on a pre-save list on your favorite streaming app. And on Friday when that song comes out, you will have it in your car or wherever you listen to your music. Also, you can call your favorite radio station and ask them to start playing this song. It's going to be public nationwide and we want to... Uh, we want to share that with the rest of the world, don't we? That's a great, great song. Man, guests, if you're here with us today, we're so glad that you chose to worship with us at Lee Park. Hope you'll be back next week for a big Easter Sunday celebration. It's going to be a great time. Guests, stop by the starting point desk on your way out. Turn in your, uh, the guest pass that you received. We've got some information for you about our church, and we just want to meet you and welcome you here to Lee Park. Let's pray as we're dismissed this morning. God, you are such an amazing God. And you are in absolute control. And as we've been working our way through the book of John, and now we're looking at Matthew and the story of Palm Sunday and how you entered into this uh, city of Jerusalem in such an amazing and odd way, knowing all the while that you are in absolute control of everything that happens. As we leave today and as we head out into our community, God, we can trust and know that you are in absolute control. May we trust that and may we live that way as we interact with the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.